Hi, I'm Phil Albertelli, and this is The Week in Doubt, episode 143. Before we get started, I'd like to thank Michael Price for donating $15 to The Week in Doubt via PayPal. That's putting you up in John Haas territory. I'll be able to build my own crystal cathedral soon. But joking aside, I really do appreciate it. And uh, I'm sorry it took me so long to notice your donation. Uh, I went onto PayPal uh, today, actually, and this is a uh, Saturday as I record this, to pay a bill, and I did a double take when I saw a deposit I didn't recognize. I think the transaction was dated back around the uh, 15th of March. So uh, around the time I released the uh, quote-unquote how to insult an atheist episode, that got me wondering if Michael was new to the show and was maybe inspired to donate after listening uh, to this staunchly atheistic uh, episode. And then I imagined him tuning in the following week and suddenly hearing a special about the life of St. Patrick. And I imagine him being like, Ah, what the heck did I just donate to? <laughs> well, if that uh, scenario conceived of by my fevered neurotic imagination is true, don't worry, once in a while I'll do a documentary special on the history of the holidays, etc. But uh, fair not, since its inception, this has been a show geared predominantly for or towards uh, atheists and agnostics, although everyone is welcome to listen and I hope that I do uh, still have some uh, believers in my audience out there. Been a while since I heard from uh, Mark Anthony Songer, a good guy who I uh, kind of became online friends with after he uh, reached out um, after hearing uh, an episode or two. And he actually um, teaches, or at least taught, uh, I think at the time, Christian apologetics. And I really like Mark and... Uh, I know that I kind of beat up on the whole um, discipline of Christian apologetics a lot on this show, so I hope I haven't uh, turned them off. But all right, all right, anyway. Speaking of the St. Patrick's Day uh, audio documentary, um, A Brief History of St. Patrick, the iTunes pricing has been fixed, so it's down to the desired $1.99 uh, price point. I feel like such a douche talking about price points, but anyway, I would have priced it at 99, um, 99 cents, that is, not $99, <laughs> but apparently that is as low as I can go with a track of that length. I keep going to TuneCore to see if anyone's bought it yet, but apparently it can take up to two months before the sales records or reports come in. Oh well, <laughs> have to see what happens. Um, but in the meantime, I'm very happy with uh, Michael Price's donation. Uh, but enough about that. So yesterday was Good Friday, and I ate at Burger King, bacon double cheeseburger. And the only thing that causes me the slightest even hint of guilt is the fact that animals died so that I could stuff my face. No religious guilt, though. So if you're not familiar, Good Friday is supposed to commemorate the crucifixion and death of Christ, and it's supposed to be a fast day. So it got me to thinking about this song I like by an alternative band um, called Rasputina. They have a song entitled Rats, and it's about a pope allowing people to eat rodents on Good Friday or uh, during Lent by declaring them fish. So it got me wondering if this was just completely satirical or whether or not there was some truth to the story. So I did some research online and it turns out that the church actually did on at least one or two occasions reclassify certain rodents, including capybaras and beavers, as fish so people could eat them without breaking Lenten dietary restrictions. I was tempted to make a joke about eating beaver, but this is a family show. Actually, it's not, but still, I better refrain. Although it's probably too late. I've already put the uh, double entendre out there. <clears throat> I hope I didn't uh, offend anyone's sensibilities, especially Michael Price. I don't want to insult the golden goose. <clears throat> But anyway, before I read an article on the topic, would you like to hear a little bit of Rats by Rasputina? All right. Many, many is the 
Here's a little bit of uh, an article from Scientific American, and this is by Jason G. Goldman. It's entitled, Once Upon a Time, the Catholic Church Decided That Beavers Were Fish. From time to time, politicians and other rulers of men like to categorize the natural world, not according to biology, but rather for convenience or monetary gain. Take, for example, the tomato. Well, actually, I'll skip down. We don't need to... Uh get mired in tomato controversy or controversy. Um, okay. There were once between 60 and 400 million beavers, Castor canadensis, occupying the rivers and streams of North America, from the Great White North to the deserts of northern Mexico. Then the Europeans came. With them came disease, along with an insatiable desire for beaver pelts and for beaver castorium a urine-like secretion often used in perfume and cologne, combined with the once sustainable hunting of beaver by indigenous North Americans for their meat, the beaver population rapidly declined. The species is now rebounding thanks to trapping regulations and now includes some 6 to 12 million individuals. If I can digress for a moment, I was just reminded of something when they brought up uh, beaver castorium. This is one of those things, you know, I, I think I'm a fairly trustworthy person. I don't say something unless I'm sure, and if I'm not sure, I say that I'm not. Um, but I, I can remember a good friend of mine, like a year or two ago, was really incredulous when I was trying to get him to believe that they use secretions from beavers' anal glands in certain products, including some uh, food products. But it's pretty common, you can look it up. But the, the secretion, as the article points out, is castorium. And I remember I learned about this after I did some research on the internet about gross things that are in food. Not that I even go to Starbucks. Um, but remember that uh, news story uh, like a year or two ago that had to do with Starbucks uh, coloring some of their or one of their red drinks using um, crushed red beetles, basically. And I guess technically it is a very safe additive and probably safer than, say, red food dye, but people, including myself, just have a hard time getting around the fact that you're eating crushed beetles. So while reading up on that, I, I learned about beaver castorium. Um, I think it can be used to sweeten certain <laughs> foods or something like that. It's gross, but look it up. Beaver castorium is actually used in certain foods, I think like candies and stuff. And then I think uh, there's also an amino acid known as L-cysteine. Uh, it's in a lot of bread, and I guess it helps to kind of... Um, I forget what the word is, but I think it kind of softens the bread or makes it easier to work with. But if you look at, I would say like 50% of the labels you look at in the supermarket for bread will say L-cysteine. And it's a, an amino acid that's harvested by rendering usually animal horns or bird feathers. And this sounds unbelievable too, but if look it up online, it's one of those things I still have trouble believing, even though I've read it from multiple sources, that supposedly sometimes L-cysteine is made from human hair. Specifically, um, people in China will basically sell their hair. Uh, you know, people are kind of in financial dire straits and want to help their families out. Okay, so right about now, you guys are probably saying, Phil, yeah, you, you always try to be uh, truthful and honest and give us the facts, but you're out of your gourd on this one. So... Through the magic of editing, I'm back. I, I was reading up on L. Sistine again, some various articles online that I decided to go to after vetting that, you know, it, it is discussed in different articles and whatnot. Once again, I've gone to Wikipedia because they tend to distill things nicely. 
And here it talks about industrial sources of L-cysteine or L-cysteine. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. The majority of L-cysteine is obtained industrially by hydrolysis of human hair, poultry feathers, or hog hair, with human hair being the preferred method due to its efficiency in producing large quantities of L-cysteine. Synthetically produced L-cysteine compliant with Jewish kosher or Muslim halal laws is also available, albeit at a higher price. Price. The synthetic route involves fermentation using a mutant of E. coli. Um, well, I'll, I'll just stop there. But <laughs> yeah, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. Okay, so back to the beavers. In addition to disease, the European settlers also brought Catholicism with them and successfully converted a large proportion of the indigenous population. And the Native Americans and Canadians loved their beaver meat. No jokes. So in the 17th century, the Bishop of Quebec approached his superiors in the church and asked whether his flock would be permitted to eat beaver meat on Fridays during Lent, despite the fact that meat eating was forbidden. Since the semi-aquatic rodent was a skilled swimmer, the church declared that the beaver was a fish. Being a fish, beaver barbecues were permitted throughout Lent. Problem solved. The church, by the way, also classified another semi-aquatic rodent, the capybara, as a fish for dietary purposes. The critter, the largest rodent in the world, is commonly eating during Lent in Venezuela. It's delicious, one restaurant older owner told the New York Sun in 2005. I know it's a rat, but it tastes really good. Um, and that, uh, obviously you guys know I love animals, but I feel really bad for the capybara. I don't know if you've ever seen those things on like Animal Planet or whatever. They look like giant dog-sized hamsters almost, or probably bigger than many dog breeds actually. They're, just, they're absolutely huge. If you go on YouTube, you can actually find videos of people who have capybaras as pets and walk them on leashes. And these things are just massive. You know, they're kind of thick and round like a hamster or whatever, but I would say their height at the shoulder, maybe like, I don't know, a golden retriever or something like that. Just giant rodents, but I think they're pretty cool. And uh, I always get bummed out when I see uh, people from Peru or whatnot um, eating guinea pigs too, because uh, I think they're really cool animals. Um, and now I just remembered this event out of nowhere when I was a little kid in elementary school and uh, a f our female teacher had a guinea pig named Jake and I remember one day we all came in the class and she went to check on Jake and he was dead and uh, she started bawling and there we were a bunch of little kids with a crying woman and a dead guinea pig um, but anyway cultural relativity though right I mean I was just joking about how I was eating uh, a bacon double cheeseburger. And right there, there's two mammals, a cow and a pig. So I can't really hold it against uh, indigenous people for eating uh, guinea pigs, I guess. Well, should I digress some more? Um, the thing about the pigs and cows, I think I told you guys on the show before how after seeing undercover footage from a factory farm and the way the pigs were being treated. I think I did successfully abstain from eating pork for like probably almost half a year, in between like three months and half a year, I forget, before I finally fell off the pork wagon. And I was recently watching a debate on YouTube between, uh, it was an Australian debate between vegetarians or vegans and um, people who support the idea that we should keep eating meat. And there was this one guy who was talking, this middle-aged Australian guy with a mustache, and he was telling this story about how he was a successful businessman and never really stopped to think necessarily about the welfare of animals or anything. And what made him go vegan, I guess, was... Uh, when his father was dying, he, he was talking about, like, the agonized, suffering sounds and kind of, like, wails and moans his father was making while his father was dying. I don't know if his father died of cancer or what it was exactly, but he said something about that made something click, and it made him realize that basically, you know, we suffer and die, and we're animals, and animals can, uh, you know, it also experience suffering and pain. And um, 
And I don't want to digress too much into a whole philosophical discussion about um, the value of human life versus the value of animal life. I mean, I believe it's just a plain old scientific fact. We're animals, we're mammals. Furthermore, we're primates. <laughs> we're one of the great apes. Um, but many people are uncomfortable being compared to animals. I'm not. Um, I like that sense. I, I've always loved animals, and I don't mind that I'm an animal too. It gives me a further sense of solidarity or kinship with other uh, life forms. Yeah, but anyway, there's something about his father. His father's suffering made him more aware of the suffering of animals. And I, don't, I think he might have quoted Ingrid Newkirk, you know, the head of PETA, the founder of uh, PETA. And, you know, kind of similar to some of the more over-the-top atheist signs, th there's been times when I've had issues with some of PETA's methods and uh, some of their billboards and things like that. But I, I strongly back uh, fighting for animal rights and for raising awareness uh, about how animals are treated. Um, but I think Ingrid Newkirk once, once said something like, and I'm totally paraphrasing, I forget the exact words, but something like a cow is a pig is a sheep is a boy or something like that when it comes to pain. And, and I guess, and I think he quoted her during this talk and the point, I wish I could remember the guy's name and the point he was making is that, um, you know, all animals might not be equal in intelligence and self-awareness and, and things like that. But animals, especially more advanced animals like mammals, uh, are keenly aware of pain or they're probably just as capable as we are of feeling pain. You might be able to philosophically argue how, you know, self-aware of their own pain they are. Uh, I think animals are probably more I don't know if self-aware is the right phrase, but I think they're probably more aware than a lot of people give them credit for. And anyone who's ever owned a pet and, uh, you know, you see maybe the someone accidentally steps on your, your pet's foot or they get their, um, you know, their leg caught or something and they begin screaming and you look at their little faces, you know they feel pain like we do, you know what I mean? Um, and this whole topic of animals and how they experience pain reminds me of uh, how recently, maybe while well, listening to a couple of different debates, I heard th people talking about, uh, usually pejoratively, rightfully so, that supposedly Rene Descartes, uh, obviously the famous uh, French philosopher and mathematician, had a theory that animals don't experience pain. And in fairness to Descartes, I was kind of looking over an academic paper uh, earlier while researching the subject, and there was someone in academic circles who, in a paper, was arguing that Descartes might have been misunderstood and that the contrary might be true, and he actually did think that animals uh, feel pain. I don't know what the uh, truth is, but if he did hold the belief that animals don't feel pain, that's just ridiculous. And another reason, other than just our observation of how we're able to clearly see, you know, that animals seem to show signs of physical and emotional uh, distress, is that they basically have the same neurological equipment as us. You know, they may not be as uh, self-aware or whatever, um, but all mammalian brains are, relatively speaking, pretty much the same. Uh, a dog, if you look at the dog's brain and a human's brain, there's really not that much uh, difference. Uh, structurally, they're very similar. And of course, you can almost see the story of evolution by looking at the accumulated layers of the uh, human brain. If you go from the outer neocortex uh, all the way down towards our brainstem, which is basically the equivalent of the um, kind of rudimentary reptilian brain responsible for autonomic uh, functions, etc. Yeah, but I would say if you actually believe that animals don't feel pain, you're a, a jackass and you're insensitive, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Oh yeah, and that paper I was talking about, if you're interested, it was from academia.com 
edu and is by someone named Emra or Emmer Arda Erdink. <laughs> Sorry if I butchered your name, but you're probably not going to hear this anyway. Uh, and I don't know if they're like a grad student or if they're a professor or what, but I think the paper is entitled Descartes' Account of Feeling of Pain in Animals, and there's an abstract here. René Descartes is considered by many philosophers of ethics as the main figure of the view that animals do not feel pain, so we can inflict pain to them by killing, eating, and experimenting. However, in this paper, I will give an interpretation of Descartes' argument concerning this issue and will conclude that, on the contrary to the orthodox view, he gives credit to the idea that animals do feel pain. By means of this, this paper is going to deal with the issue of natural automaton. That sounds weird, because an automaton is basically, you know, like a robot, to put it uh, simply. And that seems like a weird phrasing. Going to deal with the issue of natural automaton, language argument, and the mind-body issue concerning sensations. Ultimately, I will show that according to Descartes, animals have sensations and they feel pain. And on a side note, it reminds me of how when I was a kid, maybe um, in my late teens, when I was first really getting interested in philosophy, uh, I had no idea of the the proper pronunciation of uh, French names. I had no idea how to properly pronounce French names, so I think I used to refer to Descartes as uh, Descartes. <laughs> There's my uh, em embarrassing uh, admission of the day. But anyway, uh, so what happened was uh, the guy mentioned in passing that he made a documentary series called Earthlings, and you can actually watch it on YouTube. I didn't get very far. You know, it's funny, I can watch horror movies and I have a pretty strong stomach for stuff like that, but it's hard for me to watch animals suffering. And one of the first things you see in the movie, I think, were, um, or maybe I'm confusing Earthlings, but, but it did show similar footage with maybe a story I saw in The Young Turks about the way cows are treated. And it was showing cows... Um, being dehorned and you know they're taking these big i don't know what the heck they are almost look like big sha uh, shears or big pliers and they're basically just ripping or breaking the cow's horns off and the cows are screaming or you know making these um agonized noises well i don't know if cows can scream per se but they were definitely in pain and making noises and fresh blood is streaming out from where the horns have been broken off. Just horrible stuff. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Uh, something spurred me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's one of those stream of consciousness episodes. So next up is a story having to do with Georgia's controversial Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And this has been uh, in the news a lot lately, so I felt like I had an obligation to talk about it to some extent. But it seeks to allow business owners to turn customers away or deny them service based on religious objections. And they might say objections, plural, but it seems like the main point of this legislation is to try to give Christian business owners the right to deny service to gay and LGBT individuals under the guise of religious freedom, or in fairness, based on uh, their religious beliefs, I guess. So here's a story from the Huff Post entitled, Florist Explains Why She'd Serve an Adulterer But Not a Same-Sex Couple. Days after the owners of Indiana's Memories Pizza made headlines for declaring they wouldn't cater to same-sex weddings, other companies have followed suit, this time in Georgia. And just on a side note here, um, that Memories Pizza, uh, they were catching a lot of flack online for their um, statement that they wouldn't uh, provide pizza to same-sex uh, weddings or whatever. And... In response to that, now people on the right have uh, come to the aid of this pizza place 
And I think it might have been through the Young Turks, but I heard that through some kind of crowdfunding thing, they managed to raise like $200,000 so far, I think it was, for this uh, pizza place. But anyway, I'll continue. Flower shop employee Jennifer Williams told CNN's Gary Tuckman that she couldn't serve a same-sex couple who sought arrangements for their union. It doesn't mean that I love them any less because I don't, Williams said. You can still love someone even if you don't serve them. A second florist, Melissa Jeffcoat, felt similarly. I would respectfully tell them that I'm sorry. I just don't want to do it because of my belief, she said. Jesus died on the cross for me. So I don't know why I'm laughing. So that's the least I can do for him. Interestingly, she said that she would willingly serve a customer who committed adultery, but not a gay person. It's just a different kind of sin to me, and I just don't believe in it. Jeff Coates' son, Carlton, echoed those sentiments, noting, I serve a God who's higher than any Supreme Court judge. And I haven't seen my comment show up on the Huffington Post yet, but this morning I um, said something glibly to the effect of, because he says here, I serve a God who's higher than any Supreme Court judge. And I said, well, if God were high, that would explain a lot. And I was going to go into things like birth defects and uh, natural disasters and things like that. But I didn't bother. Uh, <laughs> but I, maybe it's for the best that it didn't end up uh, showing up in the comments uh, section. Anyway, I'll continue. Georgia's Religious Freedom Restoration Act, Act, which mirrored Indiana's controversial legislation, failed to get final passage April 2nd and never made it out of the House committee. Coca-Cola was among the Georgia-based corporations to decry the bill. And here's a quote. As a business, it is appropriate for us to help foster diversity, unity, and respect among all people. Company officials wrote on their website, we advocate, we advocate for inclusion, equality, and diversity through both our policies and practices. Coca-Cola does not condone intolerance or discrimination of any kind anywhere in the world. Well, I think that's a good stance for Coke to take. It should uh, go without saying. And also, a lot of these big companies probably probably realize uh, the way the tide is turning. Remember, it wasn't that long ago. Remember when Barack Obama said that he believed that uh, marriage was supposed to be between a man and a woman, and then support for um, gays being able to serve openly in the military and, and able to marry... It just picked up so quickly that politicians had to uh, change their positions. Or I, I think I'll give Barack Obama the benefit of the doubt that um, he was probably, I, I would hope, pro-LGBT rights, even when he felt like it was politically necessary for him to uh, opine otherwise. Even though that doesn't make him look uh, very good, I have to say. If he's only willing to support gay rights, uh, well, I think he was always behind civil unions and things like that. But in the in the case of gay marriage, the fact that he had to wait for the popular opinion to change before he would come out and uh, offer his support. I mean, it's good he did, but it's kind of cheesy, <laughs> for lack of a better adjective. I've been drinking during the course of this show. Um rum and coke so if i sound less and less eloquent as we go along um you might have some insight into why but i, I thought there were some really good comments by readers maybe they order comments according to popularity because this one individual is still at the top of the comments thread got a uh, 406 likes, and, and I really like what he had to say. I think he sums it all up pretty uh, concisely. And his name's Brian Lord, and he says, Anti-gay bigotry hidden behind religious conviction. If they actually refused to serve anyone who violated their religious beliefs, they would go out of business immediately, but they exclusively target gay people because they are nothing more than homophobic, uh, because they are nothing more than homophobic bigots. Then underneath, uh, someone named Danny Gray says, 
Charles, these are all the sins mentioned more in the Bible than being gay. Murder, adultery, theft, blasphemy, judgment, etc. If it is really about religion, they should refuse to serve any who committed any of those sins. And I think those are great points. And once again, kind of hypocritically, they did say they would serve an adulterer or someone guilty of adultery, um, but not a gay couple. And that's a good point about other sins being mentioned more in the Bible than homosexuality. The, the mentions of homosexuality in the Bible are very few and far between and, and very fleeting. There's that brief bit in Leviticus about um, how if a man lieth with another man or whatever, <laughs> you know, he should be put to death. And then there's a couple of things, I think, in the New Testament where... Uh, Paul seems to um, speak less than favorably about uh, same-sex uh, relations. But if I remember correctly, it might have something more to do with uh, kind of licentious behavior outside of monogamous relationships than a definitive disapproval of same-sex relationships. But yeah, I mean, adultery alone, I believe that's mentioned much more frequently in, in the Bible than uh, homosexuality. But this kind of falls into uh, that category that I've mentioned before on the show. I like to break morality into two categories, you know, a kind of universal morality, these things that most decent people from all cultures w would tend to basically agree on. You shouldn't steal, you shouldn't... Uh, kill, you shouldn't rape, uh, things like that. And then there's the more arbitrary morality, things where no one's really getting hurt, but your holy book says that they're uh, forbidden, so you view them as being wrong. And like uh, picking up sticks on the Sabbath, eating shellfish, and uh, same-sex relationships. Uh, two consenting adults of the same sex want to have a relationship with each other. I don't care if it's a casual sexual relationship or if it's a loving, monogamous, committed relationship. If there's two consenting adults and no one's being hurt, I mean, who cares? And people on the, uh, yeah, and, and the religious people might try to argue that it's unnatural or things or something like that. But then, of course, we can look at what science tells us and just how common homosexuality is in uh, nature um, and uh, among other mammalian species. And here's a short list of animals that display homosexual behavior, not a comprehensive list by any means, and this is from uh, Wikipedia. Bison, brown bear, caribou, uh, domestic cat, domestic cattle, chimpanzee, dolphin, marmoset, dog, elephant, fox, giraffe, goat, horse, human, of course, koala, lion, orca, raccoon, also some bird species, barn owl, chicken, uh, gulls, emu, king penguin, ma mallard, raven, seagull, um, fish, the Amazon molly, black stripe, top minnow, uh, grayling, jewelfish, and a bunch of others, salmon, and uh, also even some insects and uh, reptiles as well. So if it occurs frequently in nature, by definition, uh, you can't really say it's unnatural. All this, although I shouldn't even have to say all this. Um, you know, it's funny, I was giving this a, a lot of thought, and I think in a way, it, this this issue does put Kind of similar to how I say, you know, a reason why, the reason why abortion is so controversial is because it puts two important rights at loggerheads, you know, the right of the unborn to live and the right of a woman to choose what she wants to do with her body. And I think I just talked about my views on abortion, how they kind of mirror Christopher Hitchens uh, last week. So I'm not going through all that again. Um, and I think maybe in a similar way, this issue puts two important rights at loggerheads. The right of a, a person, a business person, to be autonomous and decide how they want to run their business against the right for equality and uh, the right of gay people to be treated with dignity and not treated like second-class citizens. 
So I was trying to go over this. I remember thinking about it at work as I was slaving away doing uh, carpentry or whatever. Um, and I kind of used my family business as an example uh, or in my hypothetical. Um, and I was thinking that some of the people who seem to be saying uh, I wouldn't serve a gay couple, it seems like they're people who are kind of um, contractors in a sense or people who kind of uh, aren't just selling a product, but they're hired to, pro to provide a certain service. Uh, like providing wedding photography or making flower arrangements or providing catering or something like that. Uh, so it's not like they're just reaching behind a counter and, and handing you a, a product in exchange for money. It's the type of occupations that require time and effort and commitment to a kind of prolonged task or whatever and kind of similar with my family business like with remodeling um whether or not you take on a new customer i, I mean that could be a pretty big commitment you're practically living with the people you know if you're going to build an addition for someone that can take months if you're going to remodel someone's kitchen or bathroom, you know, you have to gut everything, uh, get a series of inspections, uh, build everything back up, bringing in all different subcontractors, you know, plumbers, electricians. Uh, then eventually you get to the point where, uh, you know, you do the finish work and, you know, you, everything's closed up and everything. But... Uh, yeah, so there's times even with my family business and, and with other contractors where maybe someone approaches you with a project and you've just got too much on your plate or you just think that this job is going to be too involved and, and I can't commit to it right now. And so I think there is this freedom that uh, kind of trades people need that... Uh, you know, this kind of flexibility to decide who they're going to work for and what jobs they're going to take. So in a way, it's a, yeah, people should have a right to, to choose what clients and what jobs they want to take on. But at the same time, it's morally reprehensible if, if your reason for turning down a client isn't because you're swamped or you simply just don't feel like it. It's because you don't approve of their lifestyle. You think their lifestyle's dirty or sinful or something like that. And like those commenters on the Huff Post we're getting at, there's like, I mean, everyone's committing some kind of sin, you know, <laughs> if, uh, and probably sins that are spoken of a lot more than uh, homosexuality in the, uh, in the Bible. This, there could be, you know, a, a guy, uh, you know, uh, a guy who's otherwise normal, uh, but he steals office supplies from work. There you go, breaking one of the Ten Commandments. He's stealing. <laughs> Even though, you know, that's relatively like a small deal. Uh, yeah, there could be a guy who's sleeping around on his wife. There you go, adultery. Um, there could be a guy who curses a lot and says, God damn, and this and that, uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. But their big bugaboo is, is homosexuality. They don't like gay people. You know, and they don't want to have to uh, serve gay people. Um, so I think that's kind of the issue. You, you know, where do you draw the line? Um, I think people who sell, a, you know, a, let's say businesses like a restaurant or a convenience store, a department store, hardware store, whatever, places that, you know, provide food to people who come in off the street or places that sell products from behind a counter or whatever, you know. I think places like that shouldn't be able to discriminate for any reason. You shouldn't, unless someone is being disruptive, disturbing other customers, I mean, you should wait on everyone equally sell them a pack of cigarettes from behind the counter, sell them uh, a new hammer, um, you know, make them a meatball sub or whatever it is. But when you get into things like 
working on a wedding, you know, a giant multi-tiered wedding cake that might take a week or something, or, um, or having to actually go to a wedding, travel to a wedding and take pictures all day or something like that. What do you do if you suspect people like that are turning down the client, not just because they don't feel like taking on the work, but out of bigotry? I mean, how do you handle that? And if the, uh, and even if you could prove that the motivation was bigotry, I mean, how do you punish the individual? What goes on? I mean, is it a civil court thing? Or I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's the year 2015. Uh, I don't think people should have to deal with this kind of bigotry. But I guess there's always going to be uh, small-minded people. Or unfortunately, you know, we have to deal with people who have kind of uh, fundamentalist religious views. They're, they're, uh, I don't want to say always. Hopefully someday uh, we'll be rid of religious fundamentalism. But for now, you know, it's as far as we can see, we're going to have to deal with people like this here and there. And I think another good point that people make, too, is that, um, no, actually, no, it's not a good point. I was about to say some people are making the point that if you're a gay couple and you're looking to have to get flower arrangements or looking for a wedding photographer, why would you go to someone that you know is kind of ultra religious or conservative and isn't going to wait on you or whatever? Um, but I guess the thing is, you might not know those are the the beliefs of uh, of this individual until you actually go and. Uh, seek their services. But then may maybe the point that people are trying to make is once you find out the views of that person, why would you want to try to legally force them into uh, providing that service for you? Um, why would you want someone who doesn't approve of you at your wedding or uh, catering your event or whatever it is? Well, I guess one reason might be just to make a kind of civil rights point, you know, um, that if everyone just backs down and says they're a bigot, let's not, uh, let's not force it. Just let the bigots be bigots and that's it. Um, then maybe this type of thinking would kind of grow like a cancer or whatever. But if you stand up to these people and, um, and shine a light on their kind of bigoted or old-fashioned or small-minded thinking that it might help to keep the kind of gay rights momentum going. Uh, but I don't know. Some people say that kind of thing might cause a backlash if you try to force people into providing a service. Uh, it's just going to make them more um, bitter or hostile towards you. That's a... It shouldn't be a complicated issue, but in a weird way, it is. Um, and I don't know what the solution is. Like I said, if if it's a store that simply sells goods uh, or um, a restaurant that serves people who come in off the street, then I think you know there's no excuse. You can't discriminate. Uh, but I think it's a little bit more complex when you're dealing with... Uh, kind of work for hire situations. Um, and I'm not sure how to uh, resolve that. Maybe it'll be like a uh, Darwinian natural selection type of thing, <laughs> where as society becomes more secular and uh, open-minded and progressive, that uh, small-minded, bigoted individuals um, will kind of lose business and fall by the way wayside as people like Coca-Cola, obviously already a corporate giant, but you know, they're, I think not only are their anti-discriminatory sentiments good ethically, but they're all, it's also smart business. Uh, you know, the, the businesses that a more inclusive and less judgmental will hopefully end up accumulating more business in the long run. Uh, we'll see. But I've been rambling for a while. Do I sound drunk? I think I might have a buzz or more than a buzz. <laughs> that probably means it's a good time to uh, call it quits, but that would be an interesting uh, show. Um, 
me trying to wax philosophical while absolutely wasted. I, I had thought in the past about actually like doing a show from a party or something like that, uh, where I kind of, you know, I interview uh, some people in like a kind of party-like atmosphere and kind of wax philosophical with my friends about religion and stuff like that while we have a, a few drinks. But that could quickly uh, devolve, I think. Uh, but anyway... Uh, I guess I'll call it a wrap for this week. You guys know the drill. Uh, you can like the show on um, Facebook. You can follow the show on Twitter. Uh, you can subscribe or rate the show through iTunes. Uh, you can check out the archives at Podbean. You can donate to the show via Podbean, as uh, Michael Price did. And you can, of course, now support the show by... Uh, purchasing the uh, Brief History of St. Patrick documentary, either through iTunes or through Podbean. For the Podbean uh, link, look in the description of last week's episode, or you can also find it by uh, scrolling down through um, my recent Facebook posts. And actually, the text in the uh, episode descriptions on Podbean is the same as the text in the descriptions uh, in the iTunes ver in the iTunes version uh, of the show, so you can also get that uh, link there. I would simply read it out to you, but it's a long alphabet uh, soup of uh, letters and numbers. Um, so I guess with that being said, uh, all right. Thanks for listening, as always, and until next week.